Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios on a glorious early October day in 2022. I am delighted and honored to be joined in the studios virtually by Harvey Silverglake coming to us from Cambridge or Boston. Cambridge. Cambridge. My office is in Boston. Uh, my home office is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Excellent. Welcome to the show. I will let you give a quick intro on, on, on your background, but I came across Harvey because I read one of his great books, Three Felonies a Day, and it resonated deeply for reasons we can touch on later. Uh, but thanks so much for coming on. Lo glad to have you here. Well, let me first tell you, um, I was not, I did not always intend to go into law. Um, when I was in high school and college, my parents, as was the case of all Jewish parents of that generation in Brooklyn born, yep. wanted me to be a doctor, a Jewish doctor. And I was pre-med when I entered Princeton. I graduated ultimately class of 64. And then after my sophomore year, I got a scholarship to go to uh, Paris and spend the summer working. Princeton got me a job. Hmm. I earned room and board. I was inter interviewing people for personal loans for large French bank in Paris, known as Crédit Lyonnais. Yep. <clears throat> and um, uh, I was, um, so I interviewed people for loans that summer. And it was the first time that I was away from my parents. And I thought about my life and I decided I really was not interested in medicine. I was interested in law. I came back, I switched from pre-med to pre-law, and then I ended up going to Harvard Law School. So that summer was, and I, I, I have, since then, I've dealt with a lot of young people because I employ paralegals, people who have graduated college who are trying to decide whether to go into law, whether to go into writing or journalism or whatever. Um, and I have always recommended that people take a year or take six months or three months outside of their normal environment to think about life so that you don't necessarily follow a plan that was set for you by somebody else. Yep. You know, it could be parents, it could be um, a, a minister, it could be a relative. Um, and, um, and so that's what happened to me. And um, I, uh, so I ended up in criminal defense and civil liberties law. I always had, um, my neighborhood in Brooklyn was kind of interesting. Um, the mantra, I, I was a half Jewish, half Italian neighborhood. And um, the, um, I used to say to the, I used to be called names by the Italian kids. And I didn't have the nerve to call them names back. There were also, of course, there were names for Italians as well as for Jews. In Brooklyn. <laughs> just as evocative, I'm sure. And just as evocative. Provided a local say, response. <laughs> <laughs> so my mantra was, um, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. If only we could teach the current generation of snowflakes that mantra. Yes, and, and that is... That was the beginning of my free speech um, um, absolutism. Hmm. The notion that as long as the Italian kids didn't beat me up, I didn't care what they called me. <laughs> Fair enough. It's a right? good standard as any. <laughs> Fair enough. And I, in fact, did become a free speech absolutist. And um, so it was sort of um, it was sort of natural that when I graduated law school, I was going to go into fields of law that included the defense of people who were charged not for what they did, but for what they said. Right. Okay. So that's been a big part of my law practice. I've represented people who were charged with obscenity and pornography, represented people who were charged with, you know, threats, oral threats. Um, and, um, people who were charged with riot, even though all they did was um, demonstrate. Um, I, I represented a lot of people who were, um, I re in fact, my, my, my first law partner and 
a current, uh, I practice with him currently, a fellow named Norman Zalkheim. He and I represented 200 Harvard students who were arrested during an anti-Vietnam War demonstration in, in, in Harvard Yard. They actually took over a building and carried the dean of students out on, in his chair, <laughs> de deposited him, a fellow named Archie Epps, E-P-P-S, right. and deposited him on the lawn outside the building. And I, I tr Norman and I represented 200. They tr they tried them. Well, they tried about 100 in the time because the courthouse wasn't big enough. The courtroom wasn't big enough for the 200 defendants. They barely, you know, managed to stuff 100 in. That's like the the the, the mafia maxi trials in Sicily 20 years ago. <laughs> Correct, exactly. And then wow. the courtroom was jammed. And there was a jury trial. It was a six-member jury because it was in the district court. And um, believe it or not, the jury acquitted all 100 of them. Hmm. That's how unpopular that war had become. And um, the DA reading the leaves, the tea leaves, he dismissed the other 100 charges. He realized there was no way. To... <laughs> no point in doing the next trial. Right. So that was, that was an interesting lesson that that actually democracy works and the First Amendment works. Um, the jury system works. Um, it was a very bracing experience to get yeah. that those hundred not guilty verdicts uh, from a jury of ordinary Americans who had decided this war never should have sure. never, never been, should have happened. So then you could fast forward all the way to the Biden administration proposing a Ministry of Truth under the, the Department of, of uh, <coughs> Homeland Security. I can only imagine being a fly in the wall when you saw that announcement come out. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, um, the, uh, the thing about history is that, and maybe this is partly a comment about defects in our, in our educational system. You know, the, was it, who was it? Was it George Santayana, the Spanish philosopher, who said, "Those who forget history are condemned to repeat, to repeat it. it." Yep. And the um, funny thing is, he he stole that from someone else. So, so Oscar Wilde's dictum of "good artist uh, uh, steal and bad artist borrow" the other way around. <laughs> well, it, it, at least you give him credit for knowing what to steal, right? Exactly right. He he, he popularized it. So you know, he was he was the PR PR spokesman for the phrase, but it's true. Yep. Absolutely true. People pay no attention to history, then they're surprised if this happens again. So I actually think that history is an incredibly important subject to teach. Um, and there should be given more attention in our lower grades. Yep, far um, more. Okay. Um, and that, since you're you are you you you're inviting me to all, all of my gripes, um <laughs> This is I a place a for them. We live in very messy times. And those of us who can ex who can explicate precisely why they're so messy are always welcome here. <laughs> well, look, democracy is messy. Um, very. <laughs> so, um, and and, and um, autocracy is less messy, but I wouldn't exchange a democracy for an autocracy for anything. The, the mess is actually very important. The mess of democracy is very important. When, when things become too neat, we're in trouble. That's my view. So, you know, I'm not one of those people who says, oh, such difficult times. Tell me when we haven't had difficult times. Um, I was born during World War II. In 1942, things were not quite looking so good in 42. They started to look better in 43. Um, so um, uh, we've always had difficult times. Um, and that's just the nature, the nature of the beast. So, um, so that's how I got into, um, my legal career, uh, being concerned about problems, people cause problems rather than problems that are caused by germs or, or, uh, or fate or whatever. Right. Um, sure. and, um, my free speech absolutism, people question me about it. Because, you know, free speech now in the days of what's called, quite accurately, I should say, even though it's sort of a mantra, political correctness, the, the need of people to think that they have to be politically correct or else they're not going to be invited to the 
right cocktail parties and they're gonna you know you kidding me i long for the permissiveness of the halcyon days of political correctness that became cancel culture and woke which is just ironclad censorship at this point <laughs> well remember i co-authored the shadow university the betrayal of liberty in america's campuses about speech codes in academia this absurd notion that in a, on a liberal arts campus some second-rate moron dean can tell a student or even a faculty member there are certain things he can't say because he's liable to insult somebody, yep. hurt the feelings of some little darling. Madness. Um, you know, um, it's so absurd that, um, that Coors and I wrote a book about it. Not, this was, and we finished the, published the book in 1998. That far back, this, right. this, this started. And then, as a result of the publication of the book, I, who's a lawyer, had suddenly hundreds of people, students and faculty members, who had been punished for things they said in liberal arts campuses, um, which in theory should never happen. And uh, we, we couldn't handle it. I mean, I was a private lawyer. I had a very small law firm, seven lawyers at the time, I believe. And um, so we started FIRE, the foundation, then named the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Mm. It has now, this year, it ch changed its name to Foundation for Individual Rights in, uh, so I forget the new name. It's, I've, I've been used to education for so, um, for so long. But we, we have an expanded um, um, uh, portfolio because the problem of, uh, of, of, of censorship of, of speech has gone way beyond um, campuses. So, um, so uh, we we're still battling. We, we started out with two volunteers and in 1999, the year after the publication of the Shadow University. <coughs> um, two volunteers, the co-founders, plus a paid executive director, we now have over 80 employees because we've had to grow as the problem has grown. Oh, the problem is metastasized. The fact that yeah. you know, the, the, the shocking video from Yale Law School of law students screaming at panelists who are trying to have, oh, the sweet, sweet irony, a panel on diversity and free speech. And they're screaming at them, you know, your, your, your being here is harmful to me is straight from the Maoist you know, book. It's crazy. Yeah, well, these, these kids have no idea what harm and what danger are. This is a dangerous world. Um, and when they get out into the real world, they're oh, going to be shocked that they'll be lucky if they're called names. Yeah. Lucky. Yeah. Like, I can think know, of five billion people who trade their lives for a career in an American blue collar, American white collar firm and yep. a daily dose of microaggressions. Yeah, sign up for that in a heartbeat. Yep. After we're in a world where genocide yeah. is still going on, oh, yeah, um, you know they they could be in Ukraine, you know, instead of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yep. Um, so um, Russian rockets hurting their feelings. Yep. <laughs> you no, know, the whole idea of hurt feelings. What's so interesting about it is democracy is built on the uh, the social understanding that. That you trade hurt feelings for being, uh, you know, shot or tortured. That that in a democracy, things are said that in other societies produce physical violence. Here we have our mouths and our ears that are right. engaged, rather than our guns and our swords. Correct. It is. And without the ability to say what you believe and the ability to sort of take it when somebody else says what he or she believes, the alternative is violence. And these idiots do not understand that. And unfortunately, more and more college administrators are in line. They're enforcing these idiotic speech codes. That's madness. Kangaroo courts. The whole idea of a speech code in a liberal arts campus 
where in theory it's supposed to be a clash of ideas, that kind of Oliver Wendell Holmes notion, mm -hmm. uh, where, where that's the whole theory of liberal education, and now it's being punished. You got to, you're kidding me. That was crazy. It, it's funny because I, I went to the University of Chicago undergrad, and I, I too was pre med, so I decided I was going to do something better with my time. Um, <clears throat> but you know, at least at least um, my university. You know, issued a statement a couple of years ago, basically extolling the virtues of you know conflicting ideas and and the rest of it, and it's it's predominantly held the line. But you know, as my kids are heading off to college, I never thought I would say this twenty years ago. But there's a long list of, of universities, starting with every Ivy, that my kids aren't allowed to apply to. I'm not paying for that, not a yeah. chance. And let's see, radically change <coughs> in a million years. Am I writing a ninety thousand dollar check to Harvard if my kid gets in, so they can go hear leftist nonsense and be told to shut up? It's it's a tragedy, and I don't know. No. Does fire fix it? How do we fix it? Can we fix it? Okay, I'm about to tell you something that I haven't told anybody in the media yet. Um, I am conducting a campaign for the as a write-in candidate for the Harvard Board of Overseers. Awesome, and. The Harvard is run by a group of, I think it's up to about 16 unelected, self, self perpetuating um, members of a group known as formerly as the President and Fellows of Harvard College, but it's called the Corp, in true Kafka is the corporation, right? The is that corporation. what it is? <laughs> I love that. And, <laughs> and um, and they, <laughs> when one member dies or retires or resigns, he or she is replaced by a majority vote of the remaining members. Mm. They really run Harvard. Right. But there is a very influential second body that is elected by all the living alumni. And that second body uh, typically it's the alumni association that nominates members for that board. Mm -hmm. As you can guess, the alumni association is composed of people who are very simpatico with the administration. They're all in bed together. Right. And But there is a procedure. If one can gather enough signatures, an alum can actually get on the ballot. I am in the process of gathering signatures and I hope to have enough signatures by the deadline a few months from now to get on the ballot. My ballot, my my campaign position is going to be this is a liberal arts campus. It's not a parochial institution. It's not a military institution. Uh, it is a liberal arts college and we have speech codes and we have kangaroo courts to enforce the speech codes. And it's completely inimical, inimical to the whole idea of liberal arts education. And I am going to run a campaign that's based upon the abolition of any and all restrictions on speech. And since there will be no more uh, disciplinary proceedings against people for speech, part of my platform is going to be to fire 80% of the administrators, there are now more administrators in American higher education. Than oh, yeah. Professors. 80%? Why so few? <laughs> the truth is I can probably say 95%. <laughs> yep. And and get rid of them and reduce tuition by 40 to 50%. Easily. And the um, university, they've done it. It's gotten, it's gotten better and better every year while it costs yep. them down. So that's going to be my platform. It makes perfect sense. That's great. It is going to run up against a lot of entrenched powers. As the best campaigns do. Yep. So that's going to be um, the, my next few months. And you've given Messy Times my first real scoop. <laughs> uh, it, you, you, you are the first one. Um, <laughs> I, there, there are reporters who are, I'm sure who are, who are waiting for the the news because I've indicated to one that I'm was thinking about this. That's great. Good but I have made a decision. We're in the we're in the process now of, of uh, gathering um uh, signatures. So you might say, in a sense, the counter revolution is about to begin. I'm delighted. Was, I will send it to every Harvard alum pal and colleague of mine and demand that they they sign yes. 
<laughs> and see, I think that there is a tremendous amount of hidden support for what I'm doing. Oh, gosh, yeah. Has you to know, be. And, and I think that parents, alumni, faculty members. Pretty much everyone you know, who's rational has got to support this. This, this Maoist madness has to end. See, I, I actually think a lot of faculty members realize how absurd all this is, but they're afraid to say anything, even though they have tenure, for God's sakes. They're afraid to say anything because they won't be invited to the right cocktail parties. So, <laughs> exactly. But I, I think that it's kind of a situation where, um, you know, the emperor has no clothes. And I am planning to say that this emperor has no clothes. And then see how people react. That's um, awesome. Good for you. It's so timely, and it's got to be done correctly, and it always has to come from within, <clears throat> you know, a given community. Because I know that certainly in Chicago, we had a lot of these discussions, and whenever it came up, I mean, every president, every dean, every professor has been consistent. Like, if you're a snowflake, you can't handle tough ideas. There's the door you can transfer. Yep. We don't do that here. We don't protect you. The world is mean. <coughs> Here, you're just having an argument. If you can't handle that, maybe we don't need you as an alumnus. Right. In a, in a world where you have you know, the Russians in Ukraine, people in this country are worried about saying something that's going to offend someone. It's absolutely <laughs> insane. Oh, it's madness. And, of course, you know, I mean, the, 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 I've harped on this for ages. Um, good, from, from a standpoint of this is not about silence. It's about compliance and control. And yeah. That's you know that was you know, Stalin's brilliant line was good propaganda is not about convincing someone of an argument it's about creating a set of conditions such that ideas you don't want to hear are not permissible and that's yeah. what they're doing all day long and for those of us who cannot be fired or canceled I don't care I've been thrown off you'll love this you'll love this in terms of free speech right so LinkedIn just this boring sort of business networking thing right. With the lockdowns and people getting boring, more and more sort of discussion of politics and like vaccine stuff crept onto LinkedIn the way it did onto Facebook, right? I encountered it. I'm telling I'm a free speech absolutist in, in many ways. In fact, in all ways. And what I discovered on LinkedIn a, a week ago, which got me booted forever, was they came across one insane ranting anti-Jewish, pretending to be anti-Israel, you know, magazine where they're screaming about American Jews who are actually genocidal and we want to kill everybody and the Palestinians, all this stuff, the usual nonsense, right? Okay, I found that pretty offensive and stupid. LinkedIn is a set of policies about kind of being polite. So I flagged it. I said, this kind of violates it. They're calling for just genocide against my children. This is kind of offensive. Nope, LinkedIn, all oh, they're fine with that, okay? So I responded, and I pointed out the flaws in their argument and why this is offensive. They're allowed to post all this anti-Jewish nonsense on LinkedIn. Fine, great, terrific. When I point it out and criticize it, I was deleted, canceled, and told that I was bullying them, and my account was revoked. I roared with laughter. I just roared. Right, well, the bully is the guy who wins an argument. <laughs> Yeah, just like it, it was just like like you're gonna you're gonna let this trash straight out of the protocols of the elders of Zion be published on your website. You got no problem with that, but you're not gonna allow me to argue it and rebut it in the public square because somehow that goes against your policies. Madness. There's no logic or reason to any of it, and that's what we're seeing. And all of the people that are making those decisions. Just spent 20 years graduating from Stanford and Yale and Harvard, and they thought this is perfectly reasonable. And it's terrifying because those speech codes begin to have real world impacts. Very dangerous. Yep. But so, go ahead. Sorry. We, yeah. So the the my so so one of my obsessions is free speech, especially on campuses, because that's where it's supposed to be freest. Yep. Hey, the way I put it at Harvard is one could be punished for saying something in Harvard Yard, which is owned by Harvard, right? that one can freely say on the other side of the fence in Harvard Square, which is Cambridge, the city of right, Cambridge, city of Cambridge. Right. Governed, governed, of course, by the constitutions of Massachusetts and the United States of America. Right. So it's completely backwards. It's madness. 
madness. But I, I want to touch on something because uh, the free speech absolutism we could spend forever on that like many people do um but one of the things that really drew me to your initial work was the the you know, the, the overburgeoning administrative state from my point of view the over you know growth of the administrative state and the fact that you know we used to laugh as young men that you know if i hadn't committed three felonies by lunch i wasn't living my life correctly uh but you know it turns out that you can easily as a normal american going about your life fall afoul of tens of thousands of laws and rules and regulations, many of which are created by administrators, not legislators, as per the Correct. Administrative agents. Yep. That's what drew me to your work. You, you explicated that so beautifully. I'd love it if we'd touch on that a little bit. Well, that was the, that's my other obsession. Not only the proliferation of these regulations under criminal statutes that were, or under civil statutes, that were the violation of them becomes a criminal offense. Um, you know, the regulatory agencies. Um, but how easy it is to run afoul. And 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 the the um the reason I'm so worried about this and you know wrote about it in three felonies a day uh is because what that does is it gives the government the ability to charge any citizen with a crime. And what that does it, it 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 you know whereas ordinarily a citizen doesn't feel vulnerable. The fact is we're all vulnerable to any petty despot who yeah. wants to get us, and um, so that's why I, I wrote a whole book on that, and that's why I'm so concerned about it. Um, it is it's critical a, for people to understand, right? They just don't get it, and that. That at any moment of the that was what life like is like in the Soviet Union or any place where they can pick you up and arrest you for anything and there's, there's no argument you had they could point to ninety five laws you didn't know existed and you run afoul of all of them and here you go. But, but you see, people don't understand the federal criminal justice system is particularly pernicious. Mm. State systems tend to be rooted in the common law. The State crimes generally are intuitive. So the average citizen understands that if you bash somebody in the nose, that's a crime. It's called assault and battery. Right. If you take something that is belongs to somebody else, that's larceny. These are obvious, right? Yep. And that's they've been developed over thousands of years of development of the common law system. Now, um, or in this country, hundreds of years. We're not as that old as a society. But in the federal system, it's really pernicious because under the Constitution, the feds do not have plenary criminal authority. The reason bank robbery is a federal offense is because these banks are federally insured. Right. There's a federal hook, okay? So let's let's say that you um you're 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 charged with some kind of swindle. Swindling is a state offense, larceny, theft. It's not a federal offense. But how does it become a federal offense? Use the banking system to wire money. You use you use a telephone in order to make a phone call during the course of this alleged swindle. Right. You you use the postal. You write you 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 send a letter. Post office is owned by the federal government, um, and if that letter goes across state lines, that's a double federal jurisdiction. So, the feds, because of the the feds, they they, they get their teeth into your life by criminalizing very ordinary things that one does, which even intuitively um don't seem criminal right by by uh because of the means that you commit the quote crime you know you use a letter you use a telephone you 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 go across from new jersey to new york so the feds have got asserted control over every aspect of life through that and I call it a trick. It's really a trick. It's a constitutional trick. Mm. And um, uh, the courts have gone along with this. Um, and um, 
that's that's why the feds uh, have so, so are able to be so tyrannical. The other thing that bugs me is that we have a federal invest in criminal uh, the federal uh, federal police department called the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which has been crooked from the day oh, that it started. Hopefully not for much longer. Gotta get rid of that nonsense. A yeah, Edgar Hoover. Um, it's J. Edgar Hoover is still alive. They still have a building named after him. Yep. Mind you, we're 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 tearing down all kinds of statues because so it turns out some you know some president it turns out was a bit of a racist. So the statues are being torn down. His name is being removed from buildings, um, but we still have a J. Edgar Hoover Federal Building, and and the reason is J. Edgar Hoover is very much alive. Mm -hmm. um, in in the current uh, bureau, uh, federal bureau of investigation, oh, demonstrably so. I would He's rather from his grave for these clowns. Yep, I would rather deal with a local Cambridge police officer any day th than with an FBI agent. Now, let me tell you another one of my gripes. As long as we're um, on the psychoanalyst couch here, um, uh, you know how the feds operate. Here's how they operate. You're being investigated either as a witness or as a as a target. You're visited by two FBI agents. Yep. Always two. Why two? One of them asks you the questions, the other one takes notes. The one who takes notes then goes back to the office, types up a report of what you supposedly you said. That. And you're not allowed to record them while they do this. You're not things. allowed to record. You can have a lawyer with you, but the lawyer is not allowed to record. So the official record, the official record of the what you said is what an FBI agent has written down that you said. I have never, ever seen an accurate Form 302. Nope. I have seen 302s of what the agent <coughs> wishes, wishes you had said and is now putting words in your mouth. So when I have a... FBI asked if they could interview a client of mine. I said, sure, come on, my office. Oh, we'd like to do it in our office. I said, well, you know, guess what? Either we're doing it in my office or we're not doing it at all. So they come to my office, two of them. One of them starts to question my client. The other one's taking notes. I pull out a recorder and I put it right on the table. I said, oh, we're not allowed by regulation. We're not allowed to have this recorded. I said, oh, that is really too bad because I don't allow my clients to talk to the FBI agents unless there's a recording. Right. So um, I think this interview is over and they get up and they leave. Yep. So I can't remember a time when I've ever had a client interviewed by the FBI. And I made a, re I made a, um, a video about this for the ACLU of Massachusetts. If you go online, Harvey Silverglade, ACLU of Massachusetts, FBI, you Google it you'll get the video in which I advise people never, ever to talk to FBI agents ever. unless they allow a recording, which they don't. Yep. Wise and, advice. And when Robert Mueller <coughs> was the uh, director of the FBI, I knew him very well because he was a U.S. attorney in Boston before he was before he went to Washington. <coughs> um, uh, he and I used to argue about this. And um, uh, I always made it clear that um, uh, my policy uh, outstripped his policy because of the, the Fifth Amendment, which allowed yeah. my client to not, not talk. And uh, thank the Lord that we have a Fifth Amendment because we have a crooked FBI. Oh, amen. It's, it's told, you know, all, all my children, God bless their good kids. So if you ever get arrested, the only thing you say is, well, my lawyer, if they ask for your name, they don't have to worry about that. The lawyer can tell you the name. Yep. You, you don't don't talk. Don't say a word. And uh, yeah, I, I remember as a good friend of mine, as a defense attorney, we were talking about the Martha Stewart case. He's like, you know, more people get in trouble by thinking they're going to explain things. Yeah. Like, Shut up. Don't say a word. Just keep saying fifth, fifth, fifth. Don't say. <coughs> don't say it'll go away. Like, you don't have to answer them. <laughs> See, what you have to realize is. That it is a federal crime to lie to any federal employee. You can't. Including a postman. The postman. <laughs> yep. Every federal employee. And, yep. and 
you know, one man's truth is another man's lie. And they get to they get to judge whether you were quote unquote lying or not. Yep. It's, it's one of the most absurd systems ever. And the main problem, because you as a defense attorney, you've seen it, right? The main problem is that most people don't understand how many a priori good, honest, law-abiding citizens get screwed by the government because they just can't believe it's possible. They don't want to they don't want to live in a world inhabited by the idea that the government is not their friend. And by the time they figured it out, it's too late and they're doing 10 to 20. And it's it's horrifying. It's horrifying. It's a waste of resources. It's an abuse of power. It, the list goes on and on and on. The, the very fact that Garland put his name to this letter calling parents complaining about school policy, domestic terrorists, it's horrifying that he thought that was okay. Uh, that was great. That makes all the sense the This world. is the United States. Can you yeah. imagine what it's like elsewhere? Uh, it, it, it is it is madness. And what I find so incredibly strange about those people who push these policies is they clearly believe that their side has won permanently and, and they will never, ever be in the minority again. Because if you believe that you might not be in power again, you would never let the government do that. But they get drunk with power and they charge ahead to the detriment of us all. It's <coughs> terrifying. Well, that's the argument for neutral rights. You never know who's going to be on top, and you might as well agree to a system where everybody has rights because you're liable to be in the minority, and, and at any given you know time. Oh yeah, I mean, and what, what I find so funny is it's something that little children get instantaneously. Like if they're you know there's 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 a bunch of cookies to be divvied up, and there are two kids, right? One kid gets to do the dividing, and the other one gets to choose, like like. Children get get fairness easy and early. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So what um, what 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 are, what are the sort of main things aside from the, the aside from, but you know, in practical terms, how do you both express your own advocacy, and then you know how do you suggest others who who wake up and realize there are these serious headaches? How do you go about fixing it? Right. I mean, this is this is not new news that we've got this incredibly abusive FBI and this this you know runaway DOJ. What do we do about it? Well what I try to do when I when I give a talk or I'm talking to somebody, I try to put this in the context of their everyday life. Mm. Let me give you an example. You know, to teach theoretically is one thing, but you try to put it on the level that somebody in, is going to understand because it happened in their, in the, their, 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 their life. Right. I taught for one semester in the Cambridge school system. What happened was I took a sabbatical for my law practice in about 1985, a one semester sabbatical. I took off basically three or four months. And um, I, um, I did two things. One, I taught a course at Harvard Law School. In criminal law, which was my field, they had no trial lawyer back then. Wow. So the, the students had no idea what it was like. Um, the, their criminal law courses were very highly theoretical. I was the first time that a, a criminal defense lawyer taught at Harvard Law School. That's hilarious. So I, I <laughs> had one semester, and I also gave lectures in criminal law to the high school in Cambridge, the Cambridge Ridge Latin School. Mm. And I had difficulty getting in there because I was not a member of the teachers' union. And the teachers' union objected to my teaching. So the teacher had to sneak me up the back staircase. <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, true story. I believe it. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and sneak me in the classroom and I gave these lectures. And what I found was very interesting the students were surprised when I told them that they had a right not to be frisked on the street by the local cops, mm. um, merely because the cop didn't like the, the way the student was dressed, for example, right. uh, or didn't like the fact that it was a black student in, in a white neighborhood. Um, so um, um, they, I found that uh, civics education was really lacking real civics that mm. the, the students didn't understand the bill of rights wow and the most 
It was the, I think it was the most important class I've ever taught those high school kids in Cambridge hmm. because they emerged realizing they can't be stop and frisk was unconstitutional. They couldn't be frisked just because they didn't, the cop didn't like the way they looked or dressed. Hmm. Um, uh, so in a way that was the most important teaching that I've, that I've ever done. <clears throat> the second thing I realized was that the end of the course at Harvard Law School, the dean offered me a tenure track position. Mm. Uh, it was a very interesting course. Every the, my student evaluations were terrific, but I had seen enough of academia. I turned down a tenure track position at Harvard Law School and went back to my law practice because I saw what was already starting to happen, and I knew that I couldn't wouldn't be able to stand it. Mm. Oh, yeah. Able to stand it. I'm sure. And, and I was not going to, you know, at that point in my career, I was, see, 85. I started the practice in 67. So I was about seven, 20 years out. I was not going to spend the rest of my career knocking my head against the academic wall. Right. I, rep I represent a lot of students. I represent a lot of faculty members. Um, I give a lot of lectures on campuses, but if I was a professor, I would be a raving maniac and lunatic right now. But it's a, it's an interesting point. You, there's this great book I read. I didn't finish finish it all, but it's called The Nonsense Factory. You read that? It's yep. I loved it. I mean, in terms of because I'm not a lawyer, but having you know, I have to work work with many and hired many. Um, it's it's been fascinating just just to, to see that description because having spent my career on wall street that is all experientially learned right you can bother you get an mba whatever i mean it's got about as much utility as anything else um but it's all you know you there's there's no place you're going to go and i said i used to give i still do lecture at colleges occasionally and uh and it was usually about kind of a an insight into how you know real cross-border m a gets done for example whatever it is and it's fascinating because the kids always ask, well, why isn't that on the curriculum? I said, well, the part of the problem here is, which may be different than law, but for things like the capital markets, these are valuable insights and secrets that make people money, right? I've got no desire to, you know, I'm teaching you now because I'm here for, you know, the teacher asked me to be here for a quarter or whatever it is. Um, but it's kind of fascinating. That's why I loved about the nonsense factory is it just described such a vast gulf between the practical reality of, of legal education in this country and the practice of being a lawyer. Um, has that always been true, do you think, or has it just kind of changed over time to, to match those circumstances you described? Yeah. You, was there a question? Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. I mean, that, that, was my, that was my thought, is, is the kind of the that gulf he described between the practical realities of law and how law school is structured has that always been the case, or is that kind of... Yeah, well, you know, the um, the system that's been used in this country to teach law is the case method. You go over, you know, court opinions. They're, they're, uh, they're appellate opinions by uh, appellate courts. Mm. Um, students have no sense for what the criminal justice system or the justice system really is like. Right. Because it's not taught in law schools. Huh. And why is that? Was that a conscious decision? To, I mean, you you think that would be sort of one of the practical aspects. When you go to medical school, they teach you how to cut people open. <coughs> you don't really talk about the limbic system. Yeah, because oh. early on, the way law has been taught is by reading appellate opinions, and you learn about the development of law. What you don't learn about is how it's actually enforced. Mm. So it's highly theoretical. It would be like a, a, a medical student who's learning to be a brain surgeon who never goes into the operating room to right. operate on a brain, but who watches watches video demonstrations about how to do brain surgery. Wow. Is there is there any kind of call for change for that, or is it one more sort of guild system where it's like, well, that's how I did it, and so we're just going to keep leaving it down? Well, the, the change started to happen about 25 years ago where some law schools started to give students more practical experience mm. um, by having them um, 
a handle, uh, in, 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 you know, um, uh, some indigent cases with a more experienced lawyer. Um, right. So there's there's some attempt at, at the more practical legal education, but by and large, we're still into the case the case system. Huh. Interesting. Is that is that something that if you had uh, the power to kind of wave wave a wand and change, or there structures yes. that you would change? <clears throat> yeah. But I got enough to do without <laughs> trying to re re reform American legal education. Right. Fair enough. That's someone else's headache. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Huh. Uh, is there anything kind of really, uh, we've touched on, I think, two of the core things that, that drive you. Is there anything that I, I've missed <laughs> that um, you would want people to remember? Uh, well, I think that lawyers uh, should, uh, lawyers have a moral obligation to uh, talk about the legal system. Hmm. I think they have a moral obligation to criticize laws and judges. Uh, and uh, it's hard to criticize judges because they have an enormous amount of power over a lawyer and a lawyer's career. But um, being a toady um, does not get you anywhere in the long run and certainly isn't good for the system. Hmm. So uh, I would say a little courage. Uh, th this is not um, the only area of American life which could use a little courage, but a little courage goes a long way. Hmm. That's helpful. Um, I don't think there's anything else. I mean, there, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, I think the uh, well, one quick question actually, which kind of I think relates to that, would be <clears throat> just it, it, from what I've seen or understood the. Um, the disastrous outcomes that occur in someone's life when they're presented with, you know, a what sounds like a good deal to get me out of here. I plea out of this minor charge and I don't do jail time and I can go back to my hourly job. So I do that, but then it leaves a stain on my record and I'm in trouble for years and years and years. I mean, is there is it, the kind of the app, much like the free speech absolutist thing, me, again, I'm not a lawyer at all, but sort of the, the judicial absolutist to me says every every case should go to trial. But the state should have to prove its case or drop it. Is that a rational thing? I know that would be massive amounts of costs to the rest of it, but it just seems inherently unfair to me that if I'm charged with a crime, well, I've got the resources. I'll find lawyers. I can afford not to work for three years while I defend myself, right? Lucky me. Whereas the vast majority of people can't. Like you, you're making a very practical decision not based on the justice of your accusation or not but about all sorts of extraneous activities like oh i gotta feed my kids and so i will take a plea deal and go back to work you know what do you think about that kind of stuff very simple answer i would abolish plea bargaining i think it's criminal why did i say it's criminal it is the crime of extortion hmm. Ext here's extortion i say to you Give me $10,000 or I'm going to tell your wife you're having an affair. That is a crime. It's threats. It's called extortion. Right. It is a serious felony. Yep. Uh, I believe plea bargaining is extortion. Hmm. Plead guilty and you'll get two years. Go to trial and you get convicted, you get 10 years. Right. It is classic extortion extortion i would make plea bargaining a crime and mm -hmm. that means that people will suddenly be going to trial sure that's what the system is for yep. if the system can't handle it well it's very easy get rid of some of these ridiculous criminal laws you'll have fewer trials you know it took us a long time in massachusetts uh, finally marijuana is no longer a crime in massachusetts it's still a federal felony you would have far right. fewer. So when people say, well, if everybody went to trial, the courts would be flooded. No, they wouldn't. Not if you got rid of 90% of the criminal laws, they wouldn't be. And 90% right. of the criminal laws should be abolished. Right. So that's my most important suggestion. I, I'm not going to live long enough to see it implemented. Neither are you. <laughs> Sadly, but it's an important one. I mean, it, it, it would be wonderful to have you know, a, a politician who ran on, I promise when I'm in office, I'm going to abolish at least 50, 50 laws a quarter. That's my goal. If I don't Correct. do it, fire me. <laughs> and I think, think of how much money would be saved because you wouldn't have police enforcing these stupid laws. Yep. You wouldn't have trials. 
You wouldn't have so many prisons. Oh, it's uh, madness! Did you see, did you see the the documentary, the people the people versus Tommy Chung? Yeah, I, I I point everyone I know towards that because they can't believe when I describe it. They look at me, they can't believe it. I said the, the, the taxpayer spent what thirty million dollars. Part of the 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 the, the attorneys, the, the the federal attorneys' case were clips from Cheech and Chong movies. Yeah. We put a man in jail for selling glass pipes, and it was entrapment to begin with. How is this in the interest of the American taxpayer? Right? How? It, it's madness. And I can only assume that you multiply that by thousands, and people just got trapped in the system. And uh, and that was Tommy, who had money to actually spend to defend himself. He still went to prison for selling glass pipes, not even drugs. It's crazy. Yep. It's absolutely crazy. So that's just thing. So you abolish plea bar. I like that. You have make plea bargaining a crime. Makes a little sense to the world. You've got someone who's terrified, who 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 doesn't have resources, who is doing a quick calculation as to how quickly can I you know get back to being able to work my job to feed my family. Yep. And you got this entire apparatus of the state arrayed against them. Yeah, it's horrifying. It fits classically the definition of extortion. Yep. Wow. That's that that is that is an excellent excellent one to to end on. Do you have any other major points that you would you would swipe off the system as well, or is that kind of the big one that would that that would fix many wrongs in a domino effect? Right. Well, my two major uh, ideas. That's one of my two major ideas for reform, and the other one is abolishing the FBI. Oh yeah. Well, you're you're, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> that's just got to go. There's no need for that. Never has been gone it's terrible and it's 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 sad too because i've dealt with a lot of um I've dealt with a lot of fbi folks that do some national security stuff and those but they can do those roles in other areas the fbi doesn't have to exist well they you know we be, have a cia yeah the national security role but yeah the fbi is a dangerous and useless organization at best at best wow well, uh, getting rid of the FBI and making plea bargaining extortion, those, I'm right behind that <laughs> all the way. <laughs> um, you know, Harvey, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to, to speak with me. This has been great. Uh, is there anything I missed? Is there, there sort of, do you have a new book coming out or anything? <coughs> from, from Hopefully not. I don't have time right now to do, try a new, a new book. Yeah, but your Harvard campaign, that's the big one. I'll yeah, be excited that's right that now. Happen. That's great news. Yeah. That's great. So, um, yeah, uh, anyway, I, I deeply appreciate you taking the time. This has been absolutely awesome. But from the time I read your book, I'm like, I'd like to have him on a show, and now I have a show. So there you are. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, thanks so much, and uh, always love to have you back, especially after you win the Harvard election. Yes, I'm delighted to have some confetti and champagne for that, and maybe yep. we'll be there in person. <laughs> thanks a lot, right? Oh, bye bye. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Bitcoin 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.